Uh, right. Yeah. Good morning. Also from from my side. I'm yeah quite quite happy to be here and also. Thanks, Mark, for the uh, very uh, uh, nice introduction and for the kind invitation. So I don't have to say much about myself, right? So Mark already said everything. Um, yeah, so what I'm going to, to do today is talk specifically about collecting and um, let's see if that works. Yeah, that works. Collecting and temporal analysis of behavioral web data, right? So this is to some extent, yes, uh, Mark said uh, a big part of the work um, I'm I'm doing at Gizis specifically, where we yeah, deal with behavioral web data. And of course, in the beginning, I'd like to uh, uh, say a few words of what I actually mean for the yeah, uh, context of the talk when I talk about behavioral web data. So I suppose many of you have seen this slide in one variation. So who has? Yeah, exactly. So that's some data basically released every year. And then yeah, basically you see uh, different kinds of uh, plots and visualizations. I think what that plot not shows quite nicely is that um, what you see on the web is that really there are many user interactions. There's user or yeah, user behavior when you think about uh, tweets being posted tweets being uh, liked and shared, um, uh, uh, searches on Google, WhatsApp messages, and all of these kind of things. And technically, all of those things, of course, uh, generate data to some extent, right? And I think that's really the, the interesting part. And um, when I talk about behavior web data, what I'd like to focus on specifically is things like social web activity streams, right? So things like posts, shares, likes, um, uh, um yeah web search behavior right so how people browse navigate the web how they interact with search engine results pages and so on um the browsing and navigation behavior really as i said but um, i'm also going to look into low level behavioral traces so basically things like scrolling behavior mouse movements gaze behavior and the like right and this is, uh, of course, uh, data that yeah, reflects behavior and interactions, but at the same time, as you can see at the bottom, it is very hard to separate from actual web content, right? Because people interact with uh, content, and of course, those interactions only make sense if you actually look also at the content people people look at, right? And what is the main difference with that data is really what's what's written here. It's much closer to users and their personal and sensitive information right so this is i think very important um, as soon as you look at behavior usually you look at very sensitive and personalized uh, things so why is that important data um, so also important let's say compared to for instance web content or html pages um, that kind of behavior reflects the attitudes leanings cognitive states biases of uh, people and users Without understanding this kind of behavior, we cannot understand the content, right? So this is, uh, I think, very important. What's also important from a computer science perspective is the fact that the majority of algorithms and models actually rely on behavioral data to some extent, right? So if you think on ranking algorithms that use click-through data, for instance, but at the same time, if you think about things like large language models, they are usually trained on content, and that content usually is impacted a lot by user interactions, right? So if, let's say, you take a large language model that is trained on tweets, those tweets are uh, massively impacted by the user behavior, or by the kind of data people actually have been seeing, right? So from a computer science perspective, um yeah basically all fields uh, or, or there are many fields that are concerned with information behavior right so if you think about interactive ir um, when you think about hci user modeling web mining and all these kind of things they are fundamentally relying on behavioral data so and then uh, one more yeah, topic that i think is very important also from my gizes uh, point of view gizes perspective is that also, in many other fields beyond computer science, people started adopting behavioral data, right? So computation and social science is one of those areas, right? So many people in the social sciences have been starting to adopt uh, behavioral web data, uh, data that is uh, reflecting all these kind of things that I've mentioned before. And I think, yeah, that 
of course, is very important because it really spawned entirely new uh, new research research fields and research directions beyond computer science. So some of the works I'm going to talk about are a bit uh, looking into that. So yeah, so what am I going to do in the talk? Um, I'd like to start with saying a bit or talking a bit about the challenges, right? So what makes behavioral data different compared to uh, um, other kind of data sources on the web? I think that is quite important to look at. And then I'm going to look a bit into different kind of case studies that um, yeah are concerned with collecting, sharing, and analysis of behavioral data, so specifically looking a bit into different kind of infrastructures, looking a bit into methods, looking a bit into different kind of data sets and the like. And here I'd like to talk a bit about or make a distinction between found behavioral web data and designed behavioral web data, and that's of course something I'm going to explain a bit more in detail. So uh, yeah, what are challenges concerned with behavioral web data? So one, I think very important uh, um, yeah, point is something you may have noted already on the previous slide. So that kind of data is very often tied to specific portals, to specific gatekeepers, right? So if you think, for instance, about Twitter, so Twitter has been one of the most important uh, data sources, for instance, for computational social scientists. It's also been a huge topic at the WebCon for many years, showing really that many people have been using that kind of data. But it's also a very nice example to highlight um, how risky it is to actually rely on data coming from third party uh, gatekeepers and third party providers in the sense that I guess many people have noted that the Twitter APIs have been shut down in 2023. And that's been um, a very big bummer for many people working with Twitter data. On the one hand, Twitter data yeah, is uh, very hard to obtain these days, right? So after having lots of nice, nice APIs for many years, so these days it's very hard to actually get hold of it. I think another main reason that really shows how, how tricky it is to actually use uh, that kind of data or how, how risky it is to actually rely on that data is the fact that um, people have been using Twitter data in a way that to bypass uh, Twitter's terms of conditions that actually prevented people to uh, um, um, share full text of tweets. People have been using or sharing tweet IDs for many years. and. That basic, and then basically people were relying on being able to rehydrate those tweet IDs. And with the shutdown of these Twitter APIs, that's of course been very, very hard to do these days. And that basically means that millions of data sets that only consist of tweet IDs became technically not really usable or reproducible, right? Right, so I think another problem is not just relying on these kind of uh, third party gatekeepers, but also the problem that um, data itself is not really persistent, right? So if you look at those plots, so here we've been looking a bit into a different kind of uh, uh, Twitter samples. I'm going to talk a bit more about these uh, samples later on as well. And we've been looking at um, how many or what's the percentage of tweets that actually gets gets deleted over time. And what we see is that depending on the different samples we look at, roughly 25 to 29 percent of tweets actually get deleted over time. Right. So there's a substantial amount of data that actually disappears over time. And that is something which, of course, is very important to preserve. Um, yeah, so when uh, looking at uh, what's actually been happening at the Temporal Web Analytics Workshop after Mark invited me here, um, I also tried to find out what's uh, yeah, actually been happening in the past years. And this is just to highlight that volatility and decay, of course, is a problem, not just in, uh, with respect to behavioral data, but also with respect to um, yeah, um, uh, simple web pages, because for whatever reason, um, I noted that um yeah actually the previous editions of the workshop don't don't seem to be accessible on the web did it i do should have been fixed maybe, but in, all right all right okay so we are looking forward to yeah the um, updated website um right so then yeah um data is very sensitive right so that's something i mentioned in the beginning um who remembers the release of the AOL query log in 2006? So that's uh, roughly 20 years ago. 
So no one has been, yeah, okay, Dirk, Dirk has seen that, that's good. So what happened in 2006 is basically AOL released a query log, right? So that's basically being 20 million search queries, um, which were roughly looking like uh, what you see here on the right, right? So it's basically different kind of user queries, um, the kind of clicks uh, people, people clicked on, so the click URLs and the like, and what you, um, what you see here is that, of course, the data has been de-anonymized, right? So there are no IP addresses, no actual usernames and so on being released, but that data to some extent is already somehow sensitive, right? So there are queries, not sure if everyone can see that, but things like human mold, mold on humans, uh, dog sex, and things like that appearing in that query log. And of course, it didn't take very long until people were actually able to de-anonymize that data, right? So that is simply, um, because yeah, people query themselves, people query addresses, where they work, where they live, and so on. So actual anonymization of uh, data is something that is very challenging and very hard. And that is still the prime example for exactly that. And that's one of the reasons why in 2007, actually CNN dubbed that as one of the dumbest moments in business. Um, that kind of query log release, um, yeah, making it still a prime example to really highlight that this kind of data actually is very sensitive information, right? And um, up to these days, to yeah, to the best of my knowledge, that's still the largest um, uh, query log that is out there. Shouldn't be out there anymore, but it actually still is, and there's still a few people using that. So yeah, that's one of the reasons why um, there are actually many legal legal restrictions, ethical concerns when you look at behavioral data. So as I said, it tends to involve sensitive information. There are many ethical um, uh, concerns and considerations that should be taken into account, specifically when information is taken out of context, even when um, information is sort of shared publicly on the web as soon as you take it out of context, it can actually uh, imply a certain yeah, kind of ethical considerations. What we also have is uh, various national and international laws, things like the GDPR and the like. And really, as I said, um, terms and licensing or terms and conditions, licensing conditions like the Twitter terms of services, copyright laws and all of those, those kind of things. So at the same time, um, what we also have is, um, yeah, there is in certain countries something like the right to archive, the right to research with data. So that's really wired into various national legislations. Um, there are very different constraints, right? So with respect to archiving data, with respect to sharing and analyzing data, and also for very different users, right? So when I look at Germany, archival organizations like libraries or archives or research data infrastructures like Jesus actually is, um, they are allowed to do certain things other people, let's say commercial companies are not allowed to do. And that's one of the reasons why when you deal with that kind of data, there's always a very individual risk assessment on a per use case basis, right? So what kind of data are we looking at? For what purpose? Um, who is actually using that data and those, those kind of things? Um, right, so having talked a lot about those challenges, what I'd like to talk about now is uh, really, as I promised, talking about some case studies, so or different kind of um, yeah, data sets, methods, infrastructures we have been working on concerned with collecting, sharing, and analyzing that kind of data. So this is, um, yeah, as I said, structured into two parts, right? So found data and designed behavioral data, so I'm going to um, explain a bit more of what I mean with that. And before um, talking about that, just to give some more context, right? So most of those case studies is actually work I'm doing with my department at GISES. So that's called Knowledge Technologies for the Social Sciences. Um, yeah, that's roughly 50 people. And we are looking at behavioral data basically from two perspectives. One is really the information retrieval perspective, so making data more accessible and looking at, um, for instance, search behavior, looking at uh, how, how people interact with the web and interact with information on the web. So that's more the computer science perspective. And at the same time, we look at um, computational social science and specifically facilitating social scientists using that kind of data for answering 
different kind of social science research questions and roughly yeah there are two things we are after one is insights right so really understanding information behavior for instance during web search um, looking at misinformation and um, yeah uh, communication science research questions but mostly since the department consists exclusively of computer scientists mostly we are actually looking at computational methods right so methods for crawling harvesting scraping of data ranking algorithms, uh, mining and extraction of structured information and so on. So let's start with found data, right? So found data is of course not data you find behind the sofa, but found data is uh, roughly a term which summarizes the kind of information you can actually harvest, for instance, via open APIs, via screen scraping. So information that usually is available on the public web right so where um, yeah, you can actually harvest that data even over longer time periods right so that is i think one of the uh, um, important aspects here also from a work workshop perspective um, it captures real world online information so really interactions found in the wild and typical examples are um, social web posts um, user interactions um, for instance, on Twitter, um, and uh, uh, um, yeah, what is really important, as I said, is it tends to include data that has been shared voluntarily by online users, um, but uh, users usually did not give you consent or explicit consent for secondary use of their data, right? And that, even though it's public information, which sounds already yeah, sort of something like it's easy to work with, there's still many, many kind of challenges which I think are important to keep in mind. Um, yeah, so why do we archive that data, right? So one is, of course, the um, archival perspective as a whole, right? So we want to ensure long-term archival of this kind of volatile information, for instance, from Twitter, um, independence from third-party access. We also want to train our own models, right? So that's, I think, a very important part of that. And we also want to facilitate interdisciplinary research for instance, on societal online discourse from many or with many different kind of communities. And the goal we've been pursuing was to capture a representative sample of all Twitter data. Um, yeah, so why is real time collection preservation of Twitter data important? As I said, right, so tweets are actually being deleted over time. What you also see is that um, the vast majority of tweets that are being deleted are actually deleted by a very small amount of users, right? So that's roughly what's shown in that plot. So there's some kind of power law distribution, which also means that there are certain biases in what kind of data remains on Twitter and what kind of data actually is being deleted. And those biases are also reflected if you look a bit into uh, the kind of data distributions and how they are shaped, for instance, with respect to uh, the political leanings, right? So we looked, for instance, at the political leanings, uh, the pro or anti-science attitudes within those tweets and whether tweets are more hardline or moderate. And what we find is not very surprising. Um, I think it's very hard to see here on the plot, but um, uh, that yeah, technically deleted tweets tend to be a bit more anti-science, a bit more conservative, and a bit more hardline, right? So again, that shows that there are certain biases. And another important part why archival is very important is that not only data decays, but also model decay, right? So if you think about large language models, of course, um, in language evolves. And to that extent, also our language models have to evolve, right? So that is a blot taken out of a KDD paper, looking a bit into yeah, um, sort of dynamic updates of language models. The authors here basically plotted the vocabulary shift for natural words within Twitter, right? So that's a sample of tokens, or I think the top 40K tokens. And you can see that between 2013 and 2019, the difference in the vocabulary actually amounts to roughly 40%. So that really shows you that if you take a model that's being trained on data, let's say up to 2019, and then you try to apply it, for instance, on data in 2020 or 21, where vocabulary probably spiked in terms of or changes spiked uh, simply due to the COVID pandemic, it illustrates quite nicely that, of course, um, those kind of models are not going to perform very well, right? So also for models, it's very important to have access to up-to-date data and archiving that, that kind of information. 
So as I said, we wanted to uh, um, actually obtain a representative sample of tweets, and that's also what we did, right? So we started in 2013. That's a plot which plots all the different kind of um, uh, servers where we had crawlers running, and we started uh, redundantly crawling uh, the 1% Twitter stream, so basically via the Firehose API that has been um, free back then. We set that up on uh, yeah, many different servers, even physically distributed in order to make sure we actually don't have any actual downtime. And doing that for 10 years basically resulted in uh, roughly 14 billion tweets that we collected in that time period. Um, to the best of my knowledge, that's the largest continuous tweet archive that is available for research purposes. And really, as I said, we are working a lot with that data. We also do lots of collaborations, but it's not very easy to simply make that data available to the public, simply due to, um, yeah, in that case specifically, also due to the Twitter terms of conditions. So what we started looking at um, are different ways on how to make that data accessible. So that is, to some extent, even more important right now. So specifically after the API shutdown, of course, um, there are many people who actually want to work with that data, who want to have access with that data, because it's uh, one of the few yeah, possibilities to actually do that. Um, sharing that data is not very easy, as I said, right? So there are basically two different options. One is um, uh, something that we call sensitive data access. So basically, empowering researchers to work on-prem with our data, um, really on the sensitive data. We also have some kind of secure data center where people actually can come to us and work with our research data at GISIS. The other option, and that's uh, what I'd like to talk a bit more about right now, is creating some kind of uh, uh, derivatives from that data which are not sensitive, but still um, provide the opportunity to actually do research with that data. So that's basically the second part. That's also, yeah, there are many ways on doing that. One example, um, which I'd like to mention very briefly is uh, called Tweets KB. So that's uh, short for Tweets Knowledge Base. So what we did here was basically taking the uh, English language subset of this entire Twitter archive. So it's basically the same time period. And rather than sharing the full text of those tweets, what we did was technically publishing all the metadata. So for each tweet, you basically get the timestamps, the retweet counts, the likes and the like. You get hashtags, user mentions, and dedicated features that capture tweet semantics without giving away the full text, right? So that gives some away uh, uh, some kind of information about the semantics captured in that tweet. Um, typical examples um, are, for instance, entity mentions, right? So we've been uh, running entity linkers on top of that data to basically disambiguate different mentions of politicians, persons, organizations, and the like. We've also been um, um, associating sentiment scores with those tweets um, for a subset. We also um, extracted geotags, so that's very important also for social scientists who also wanna usually have an understanding where certain tweets originate from. We've been also doing lots of experimental features, for instance, classifying whether tweets contain scientific information, scientific references, scientific claims, and the like. And that basically uh, gives you a knowledge base where individual instances roughly look like that. Let me just briefly highlight that. That is a tweet instance, right? So we lifted all that data into some kind of schema. And basically for each tweet, you get um, those kind of uh, mentions, right? So in that case here, that's a disambiguated entity and that is Roger Federer. Um, you can see that in that tweet, there's another user account being mentioned that is called Live Tennis. You can see that there are hashtags like the US Open. You can see that there are some kind of positive emotions associated with that tweet, technically with that event or, or that person, and you get all that metadata like the likes uh, and the like, right? And that is something you actually get for the entire corpus. You can also interact with that data. So there's an API and a Sparkle endpoint. Most sane people don't use the Sparkle endpoint, but actually download the dumps and uh, work with the dumps of the data, right? So that is uh, also what yeah, basically the prime prime use case for using that data is. And then as, as I said, right, so we are doing 
research a lot in many different interdisciplinary contexts and just to highlight that for instance with um, yeah communication scientists we have a project called discourse data for policy where to some extent we actually do not have to rely on the full data anymore but we actually use those kind of um, yeah pre pre-computed features in order to investigate all sorts of research questions right so one is for instance vaccination hesitancy in germany or in the german speaking countries so that's the the dach countries which yeah, has been a very um, yeah, important research topic um, for many different social scientists and what you can see here is technically yeah, there is something missing here that this relates or all these spikes directly map to certain kind of society events so for instance here those those spikes are actually caused by the uh, uh, suspension of the AstraZeneca vaccinations, where you can really see that the sentiment spikes, the frequency spikes in the data really reflect those, those kind of societal activities. Right, so then Twitter data is of course um, not um, um, everything we, uh, we work with, specifically after the uh, um, Twitter API shutdown, we have been starting to turn to uh, many other data sources, just to mention that uh, currently we have uh, work going on doing or trying to create something similar um, what we did for the Twitter sphere um, with Telegram data, right? So that is basically a corpus where we try to collect different kind of uh, Telegram channels and continuously harvest and grow all the information from those Telegram channels. That is something that is very different, right? So that could be considered or should be considered found data as well. Harvesting here is much trickier because there's actually no registry of channels available in Telegram, right? So that is a very de decentralized approach. So what we did was we started with 300 seed channels and um, we uh, basically set up continuously uh, data collection of currently roughly 400k channels and we discovered that simply by going from starting from these 300 channels and then looking at different telegram channels that are mentioned in this um, uh, uh, within those uh, messages within those channels so that's basically some kind of snowball sampling which follows the uh, the approach which you can see here, right and um yeah i mean it's uh, harder to collect that th that kind of data we just started recently so that's currently roughly 100 million messages given that um yeah we just recently um started uh, setting up those crawlers that's uh, probably going to grow very quickly right so next to our uh, tweets what we also look at is uh, claims right so that's also some kind of found data we had yesterday at our workshop for instance lots of talks about fact check claims and fact checking sources that's also something we uh, um, are very interested in and we actually have been have been looking at a lot in the past so one reason why we started harvesting that kind of information is also because that also evolves over time right so sometimes you have fact checks that actually getting updated over time for many different reasons there's another reason which is that basically these different kind of claims and fact check sites are very distributed right so you basically um, will have a very hard time in finding claims for instance about us republican politicians across the web if you really want to search in a distributed fashion and we actually wanted to create a knowledge base on top of that and that's actually what we did um, so we also here started in 2019 continuously harvesting most major um, fact checking sites i think right now is something like 15 different fact checking sites since 2019 um, we basically discovered uh, 75,000 different claims and what we did is very similar to what we did with the uh, tweet corpus so we basically extract the entire metadata we extract the uh, uh, claim reviews the veracity ratings and we try to harmonize and make that data more accessible for others one very important part is for instance to normalize these truth ratings so if you want to for instance have access to uh, um, that that data and you want to quickly find uh, all true or false claims or fake news and the like you actually have to harmonize those things because those different fact checking sites have very different rating schemes so you basically find some kind of harmonized uh, truth ratings there as well. And again, 
the data is available via public APIs. You can download it. It's uh, regularly updated. I know there are people working on a slightly larger corpus right now, but up to very recently, um, that's uh, probably the largest uh, archive of um, yeah, fact-checked claims and all that, that kind of metadata. People use it as part of shared tasks for claim matching, right? So for instance, mapping uh, random text, mapping sentences, mapping tweets to uh, previously fact-checked claims, trying to find fake news and uh, all these, these kind of things. So looking a bit into the evolution of those things, um, I think that's also quite quite interesting, right? So fact checking has become more of a habit in the more recent years. So that's something we see in those those plots as well, right? So there's, of course, uh, a few major um, fact check sources that really dominate that that the entire sphere. And what we also see is that the kind of topics. So we also did some kind of topic uh, classification of all of those claims of course, evolve over time, right? So there are things like COVID, of course, which just appeared very recently and um, uh, certain topics which started to dominate more in the recent years or in certain time periods, right? And what I think is also very important since many people use fact check claims for all sorts of research, um, uh, whether that's methodological research or more social science or interdisciplinary research, and many people work with very specific fact check sources. I think it's very important to keep in mind that, of course, different sources also have very different biases, right? So if you look at the topic distribution on the left side, that's full fact. That's one very big fact checking side on the right side. That's Snopes. You actually see that, um, yeah, the topic distribution is very different, right? So full fact was uh, um, focused a lot on more economic topics. Um, while uh, Snopes, for instance, more on politics. And of course, if you, let's say, take fake news from those pages in order to do whatever kind of research, you're always going to end up with very strong biases in those kind of kind of sites. And these biases are temporal. These biases are um, fact checks or specific. So um, yeah, I think that's a very important takeaway. And really, as I said, we also do lots of me methodological research using and trying to bring together those different kind of sources right so one is for instance stance detection right so that is um yeah very well established problem um in yeah many many uh, areas technically being concerned with understanding the stance of a document towards a given claim right so if i take a given document let's say a social media post a tweet or a telegram message or a web page it can be related or unrelated to a given claim. If it's related, then it's either, or can be neutral, or it can take a stance, and if it takes a stance, then it can agree or disagree, right? And one um, challenging problem in that context is that the data distribution in the real world is very unbalanced, right? So if you take a random document and you try to map it or try to uh, detect a stance to a given claim, the vast majority is, of course, going to be unrelated, and there's a teeny tiny amount of data that actually disagrees with the claim, and that makes it also challenging from a machine learning perspective. And yeah, what we did was basically creating some kind of um, yeah um, hierarchical classification models that really approach those different classification steps and also take into account the misclassification costs. I mean, in the sense of trying to achieve specifically for those minority classes in a sort of decent performance and we've been applying that to uh, um, the uh, um, i think it's fake news classification that's a shortcut that's a shared task being concerned exactly with that kind of problem where you can see that specifically for the disagree class the state-of-the-art methods that's already a bit uh, outdated work but has been very poor and we've been trying to focus specifically on lifting performance on those minority class distributions but that's really just more of an excursion just to highlight that there is of course plenty of methodological work which tries to bring together those different kind of data sources right so let's come to the wrap up for the found data part right so um, uh, what i think is fair to say is that as long as the gatekeepers give us access to that kind of data it's fairly easy to collect right i mean of course it's some kind of effort to actually 
um, yeah, keep those kind of growlers running uh, for a longer period of time. But technically, uh, um, it's um, uh, yeah, fairly straightforward. Um, as long as you have public APIs, you are allowed to scrape that content, there are no restrictions in place. Um, if you look at the analysis side of um, found data, then yeah, uh, data is very hit, um, heterogeneous, right? Um, you have usually large volumes of data, very heterogeneous data in different languages and uh, from different time periods and, and so on, where, of course, you can easily apply different feature extraction methods, analyze the data, but for very specific research questions, usually you would want to have very dedicated models, right? So you don't want to apply um, an English language uh, stance detection method on a German tweet, for instance, right? And that really depends on the research questions and that all, uh, that's also what makes it very hard to pre-compute those kind of features as I've been showing in some of those examples. And then the, the really hard part, and uh, that is to some extent still an unsolved problem, is actually the sharing of that data, right? So that is uh, simply due to all these constraints that I've mentioned, and scalable sharing of this kind of sensitive information is a very challenging problem, right? And I'm uh, going to say a few more words about that as well. So what is the other side of um, behavioral web data, right? So in order to address uh, specifically those kind of problems, um, what uh, we are doing a lot and many other researchers are doing a lot is designing data ourselves, right? So rather than taking data that's available out there in the wild, we actually try to uh, um, obtain data that is easy to interpret through experimental lab studies and quasi experiments. The key difference here is that usually that involves very artificial settings, right? So you really have people in a lab sitting down to simulate certain real world online scenarios. We are looking a lot into web search, for instance, trying to emulate um, how people search and give them certain search tasks. The benefit here is that it's usually much less sensitive data because if you give people artificial tasks, then usually uh, people don't share their kind of sensitive information. Um, usually you can obtain full consent of participants, right? So about uh, um, uh, whatever you collect about um, how you would want to use that, that data in the future. It is also much shorter time intervals, right? I mean, usually the data is very costly. Those kind of lab studies usually uh, cover very short time periods. And because of that, it's also much more small scale data. And um, one example I'd like to show is, um, yeah, basically concerned with web search behavior, right? So um, there's an area in interactive IR called searches learning, which is really concerned with trying to understand how people acquire knowledge during web search, right? So if you look at those different queries that could be part of a yeah, kind of search session of a user, you see that there may be someone looking for different uh, terminology in the searches learning context, um, while at the same time, maybe at some point issuing this kind of more transactional query, trying to look for a pizza hut delivery. And there you can see already some, yeah, or many different challenges involved in exactly that. One is it starts already in identifying what are coherent search missions, right? So that's already one, one problem we are addressing here. Because of course, the Pizza Hut delivery has a different search intent uh, compared to the other queries. Um, another problem is how can we detect learning throughout that search, right? So specifically, how can we detect informational search sessions compared to navigational or transactional search sessions? And then problems that are even more challenging are questions like how competent is a user in the topic and in the kind of uh, um, domain the user is actually querying for. So can we predict and understand the knowledge state of users based only on this kind of in-session behavior and interactions? That's a problem we have been looking at a lot. And how well does a user achieve his or her learning goal or information needs? So technically predicting the knowledge gain of users in the search session. So these are um, different kind of research questions we've been looking at a lot. And just to give you an idea um, about the kind of experimental setup we had in order to obtain reliable data for those kind of problems. So it's basically a, a, a kind of pipeline where we started acquiring crowd workers on Crowdflower and then 
led them um, first to some kind of pre knowledge test, right? So we gave them search tasks, we um, uh, tried to measure what kind of knowledge users actually have on that very search task. And after that, we uh, led them to a search engine that um, basically is using the Bing API underneath. So you get the same kind of search results like you would get on the Bing uh, search engine. But within that search engine, we're actually able to track and trace all sorts of behavioral features, behavioral traces and the like. And after conducting those search sessions, we basically um, measured the knowledge um, afterwards. So there's some kind of post knowledge test and that gives us basically all that kind of data we wanted to have in order to compute on the one hand or understand the um, interaction behavior while at the same time understanding knowledge of, of users, right? So this is already a fairly, fairly costly process. So essentially what we did, um, we did that for 10 different search topics, right? So search topics will rely a lot on their things like altitude sickness, tornadoes, and so on. We designed those pre and post tests together with some psychologists. And um, we had approximately 1000 distant crowd workers. So basically for each of those topics, roughly 100 search sessions. And for all of those kind of sessions, we tracked roughly 76 features, right, in different categories, meaning things like session data, query data, how queries evolve over time, complexity of queries and the like. Um, uh, features relating to the SERPs, um, so the search engine result pages and their interactions, browsing behavior, but also very informal kind of uh, features like mouse traces, scrolling behavior and the like. So here's some, yeah, first uh, some, some data analysis um, results coming out of that, um, that study, right? So one is um, what we found is that roughly 70% of users exhibited a knowledge gain. So in other words, roughly 70% of users learned something, which is good. Um, here you basically see the topic distribution and the knowledge gain of workers um, across the different uh, topics. Um, we also see there's a negative relationship between the knowledge gain of users and the topic popularity. So in other words, uh, the more familiar topics are, the more people actually learn, uh, the less people learn on those topics, which also seems quite obvious. What's also mirrored in many information retrieval works is the fact that the 12 times on web pages really give away lots of information. So the 12 time is very important to predict the knowledge gain of users. So how much people learn, the more they spend on a, a, a time they spend on a web page, usually the more they learn. The query complexity explains roughly 25% of the variance and knowledge gain. So that's also um, uh, a quite, quite good indicator. And we also see that this kind of behavior is very topic dependent, right? So it actually correlates stronger with the search topic than our target variables, knowledge gain and knowledge state. And that really gives you an indicator that it's actually important to create models that um, yeah, are topic specific and are really able to um, reflect this kind of topic specific differences. So basically as a next step, um, what we did was in that work was trying to stratify the different users into different kind of classes, right? So whether they are low, moderate or high uh, knowledge gain or knowledge state users. Um, so then we had roughly equally distributed groups simply considering the mean and the standard deviation. And then we try to train machine learning models able to predict the knowledge gain and the knowledge state of users, simply taking into account the behavioral traces, right? So rather than looking at the pre and post tests, we actually try to predict to what extent we are able to infer whether someone is knowledgeable on a topic and whether someone learns something. And I think that blood is from the uh, uh, knowledge gain prediction, if I'm not mistaken. And you can see that it's not brilliant prediction results, right? So in a one score of um, a bit more than 50% for a free class classification problem is certainly not excellent. But what you can see in that work is that technically even with small data like, like this one, it's already feasible to infer something about the knowledge gain and the knowledge state of the user simply by looking at these very informal behavioral traces. So these are all the features. I'm not going too much into detail here, just to highlight that 
if you look at the feature importance uh, for the knowledge gain prediction, as I said, browsing behavior is very important, right? So these red uh, kind of features are, for instance, the, the uh, maximum time spent on a web page, which of course makes sense if you look at knowledge gain. If I found a useful website, I learned something by reading something on that website, and um, uh, that's a very useful indicator. If you look at the feature importance for the knowledge state prediction task, the uh, situation is slightly different. For instance, the query complexity, which I think is also very intuitive, is a very good indicator for um, whether um, someone is knowledgeable on a topic. If I'm able to actually formulate complex queries, and usually I'm more, more knowledgeable on the topic. So then really just to give a very very small excursion uh, just to highlight that we're also looking at different kind of features right so um, uh, gaze data for instance eye tracking data is something we uh, um, are using a lot but where the costliness of acquiring that kind of data is even higher right so gaze data can be very informative for lots of different problems looking at how people fixate certain parts of web pages looking at how people fixate certain words can give away lots of useful information, but here you see that, of course, um, doing that usually is only possible with very small study sizes and um, for very small samples. Um, yeah, sharing that data is, of course, very important, right, simply because it's so so expensive to, to obtain. I'm not going too much into detail here. And before coming to the wrap up, just to highlight that, there are, of course, many other scenarios beyond web search where we look into behavioral data and into understanding user behavior. Another research area where we started or where we have been working a lot on in the past years is uh, microtask crowdsourcing and crowdsourcing behavior. So some very central questions really have been here, whether we can classify different worker types, for instance, detect competent workers, find out workers that are somehow malicious so not really uh, um, uh, um, working diligently on the tasks we we give them simply by looking at behavioral traces there are quite a few papers uh, we have been publishing in the past 10 years on, on those topics this is really just an excerpt just to highlight that of course mouse traces scrolling behavior key presses and all these things differ a lot between different worker types. So in a, a Kai paper in 2015, we came up with some kind of um, uh, worker type taxonomy. Two types are called competent workers and fast deceivers. And here you can see quite nicely that, of course, there are certain pattern in this kind of behavioral data that give away whether someone is really working diligently on a task or not. Right, so I guess Mark is already looking at the time a bit, so let's try to uh, wrap wrap up um, uh, what uh, um, I've been uh, uh, showing in the past uh, um, yeah, 45 minutes. Um, so what's the difference between found and designed data, right? So as I said, they vary a lot in different kind of categories. Um, for found data, data collection is something that is fairly easy as long as the gatekeeper is allowed to do that, right? So there are no legal restrictions, no technical restrictions for crawling and scraping, and it is a very straightforward process to do that even over very long time periods. For design data, that's a very costly um, process. You really have to create infrastructures and very um, yeah, um, extensive experimental settings. I think analysis on both kinds of data has its pitfalls, right? If you look at um, uh, the size and heterogeneity of found data and the fact that it's usually covering very long time intervals and um, that makes it hard to actually analyze the data as a whole, while at the same time, um, you have, of course, much easier to process data for design data because it's small scale data, because it's usually short time intervals. But for those reasons, the kind of things you can do with that data is also much more limited as well. And then I think the big difference is really with respect to sharing, right? So um, found data has lots of ethical, legal and licensing constraints, which I think is um, yeah, one of the most, most crucial challenges. And um, for designed data, it's actually designed to be shareable with others, right? So that you can really make it public uh, for other researchers to use. And for those reasons, sharing of data is very easy for our designed data as well. 
So that brings me to the uh, key takeaways, right? So as uh, I've uh, tried to say in the beginning, behavioral web data is a very crucial ingredient for a wide range of research across various disciplines that involves computer science, but many other disciplines and fields as well. There are very big differences between what you can do and how you can use found data and design data, right? So with respect to many different, different kind of categories. And for those reasons, making that kind of data accessible for our researchers is something that is very important and that's exactly what um, we at GISES are working on since uh, many years. So I've been introducing a few infrastructures for collecting experimental data, for instance, as part of web search, infrastructures for data access that we are currently working on, for instance, for tweet archives, social media archives and the like. And um, uh, what is, I think, sort of the holy grail for many researchers is actually uh, getting access to either the sensitive data itself or being able to do research on top of that data in a way that you don't have to access uh, sensitive information and tweetscape is one of those examples there are plenty of more i could have been been talking about those things but that roughly summarizes some of the challenges we are um, currently looking into and with that, just like to say thank you to all these nice people. So that's basically my department at Gizes. Um, slightly outdated picture, but of course, many of those people have been working on those things. And uh, there are a few links. And with that, um, I'm happy to take some questions, if we have time.